Greetings, Bill Mobley, UCSD Neurosciences, and I'm pleased to present another session of On Our Mind. And joining me today is Art Toga, who's Provost Professor of Neurology at USC, and a very interesting man with a very interesting history and a very important job ahead of him, a job of brain mapping. Uh, Art is really prolific, over 700 articles and chapters and abstracts, and has done a really a leadership, had a leadership role in neuroimaging. And so, Art, welcome to UCSD. We're glad to have you here. Glad to have you here for Founders Day lecture, honoring, honoring Robert Livingston. And uh, tell us a little bit about this business of brain mapping. What is that all about, and how do you do it? Well, it's really what it says it is. It's to try to map the brain. And a map is sort of an interesting concept because we're all used to looking at them. When I drove down here from Los Angeles, I was looking at the map in my car. And that map comes from a GPS system and it has coordinates and it tells me the names of the streets and where I am and it can even direct me. Well, in the human brain, we don't have a thing like that, which is really rather remarkable with all the neuroscience that's gone on for the decades that we've, we've uh, studied it. And so the notion here is to try to develop a strategy to create a cartograph, a map, that tells us the latitude and the longitude of where we are and what happens there. And that's easily said and difficult to do. And I guess it's the, the significance of that is then we know who's connected to whom. We know what neurons talk to what neurons. And then presumably, we know something about the nature of the circuits that neurons uh, create in the developing brain that are then maintained in the mature brain. What, what are the challenges in, in, in putting that map together? Well, you just touched on a couple of very important issues. You talked about the developing brain and what's connected with what. The problem with the human brain is it's not static. It's very dynamic. So that you and I are having an interesting conversation, and that conversation is changing something in our brain. Even as I think about the words I'm about to speak, I have to activate some circuits. So the brain is changing constantly. It changes in milliseconds and it changes in decades. So the brain of a young child is really quite different from the brain of an elderly person. So when you're trying to map the human brain, you have to accommodate all those changes. Not only changes within an individual, but the differences between us. Men and women are different. You and I are different. And all of those differences have to somehow be accommodated in a, into a comprehensive map. So it's uh, <clears throat> the analogy then of driving down from Los Angeles is, is a little bit like this. We know there's a Los Angeles. We know there's a San Diego. But your Los Angeles and my Los Angeles may be in different coordinate systems. And it, on Monday, there's more traffic and it's raining. <laughs> right. And on Friday, there's less. And so we have all these other dynamics that are occurring because a map and the analogy that we're using in terms of the roadway system is a static structural thing. But a map should also accommodate function and all the other ways we have of measuring brain, whether it be blood flow to certain regions, uh, neuronal activity, uh, transmitter substances, all the different measurements that we have available to us need to be integrated into this map. Are we ready to make that map? Are we ready to chart that map? Do we have the tools that we need for this dynamic interplay, this dynamic engagement of circuits that you refer to? Yes and no. I mean, I think we also can look at historical maps when we saw the, the coastline of North America, for example. It was grossly wrong back 300 years ago. That said, it still gave us an idea of where the continent was and the rough shape of it relative to other continents. Same is true about mapping the human brain. This is a, a living evolutionary process to get ever more detail, ever more accuracy, ever more comprehensiveness to it so that we can accommodate all these different variables. And, and, and I just want to add one little point. The maps that we think of are often on paper, but the reality is everything's computational now. So mm -hmm. we think of a map of the human brain, it lives in a computer. It's a computational thing where I can say, show me what the brain of a 55-year-old male looks like. And I can pull from the database all of the 55-year-old, maybe right-handed males that I know about mm -hmm. and compare those to the 55-year-old left-handed females, for example. So you have this computational element to it that allows us to substratify these maps. So there are tools, and there's data, and there's computational capacity. So what's this thing called big data, and how is it going to relate to the brain? Well, 
The amount of information that we collect on the human brain is growing exponentially. It grows exponentially both in terms of numbers or examples and also in terms of the amount of data for each measurement. The resolution gets better both in terms of time or space and the modalities themselves, whether it be MRI or PET scanning or other techniques that we use, they get more data with every passing year. The technology for acquiring this information gets more sensitive. Mm. So that's one of the problems we face. The other problem is that this effort to map the human brain has become a global effort. That my colleagues can live anywhere in the world and we share that data. Well that means I now have to transport massive amounts of data that may represent thousands or ten thousands or even hundreds of thousands of patients or subjects into a common database. It's truly a big data problem because the networks aren't necessarily fast enough. All right. And then it's not just that the data's there, it's that you've got to be able to go after that, those 10,000, 55-year-old right-handed males and understand something about their brain. So what, what, what are the tools that you see coming along to help us decode all this information? Part of it has to do with the computational strategy of how you combine things. Because you and I are so different. I mean, you know, even the audience can look and see we both have faces and we have eyes and a nose and a mouth, but we're shaped differently. But the brain is very good at finding those features. Computers a little bit less so. And so the computer technology that's needed to identify the features, not only structurally, such as our anatomy, but functionally as well, need to be improved in order for us to extract the information out of this massive amount of data that's being acquired and organized. And do we have the kind of investment in the science of informatics that we need now? Is, is, are the resources that we have likely to give us some early returns and early successes in decoding the brain? There already have been early returns and early successes. I would say that brain mapping and neuroimaging have really transformed neuroscience a great deal, systems neuroscience. Uh, as you know, it's transformed the way clinical neurology is practiced. It's transformed radiology. So there are already a great deal of benefits in terms of the care and tra treatment of patients. In the case of basic science, understanding how the brain is organized and how it works, there's a lot to learn yet. There's a lot to do yet. That said, we've made great strides. The informatics component, the computer science component, the physics, the mathematics, the neuroscience and neurobiology all contribute. This is truly a multidisciplinary effort, which I think, you know, frankly, it, it requires a little bit of uh, adaptation by universities and other research institutions to bring together people of different fields to contribute to this grand challenge to map the human brain. You know, I, I would. I would guess that you would see decoding the brain as a fundamentally more complex, uh, more challenging uh, task than decoding the genome. Is that fair? Well, I would say that, absolutely I would say that, because yeah. decoding the genome is more of a linear problem. Yeah. We have a very high dimensional problem, many, many dimensions with literally millions of degrees of freedom. Now those are statistical concepts which make it difficult for us to, to try and understand in a, in, a, in a reasonable way these complex measurements that all interrelate with one another. So imagining that, that the tools are being assembled, the concepts are being enriched, the computational paradigms are, are, are becoming enhanced. Imagine that, that that's all going along and that someday we can imagine looking to uh, a brain science that's massively richer and more informative. What do you see as the near-term outputs that are likely to not just teach people about the value of mapping the brain, but impact their life in a tangible way? Well, I think one of the things we want to do is we want to realize our full potential. You know, I'm never going to be this artist. I can never paint that painting. I can never speak five languages. I don't have it in me. I will never be a concert pianist. Now, I've learned that throughout my life, that no matter how hard I try at expressing myself in these artistic, creative ways, I don't have that in me. And I think maybe that's because I wasn't encouraged at a certain age when my brain was really receptive to learning the fundamentals that would make me more capable in those subspecialties, whether they be art or science or what have you. And I think understanding more about how the brain provides us with the capacity for behaviors 
is a really important thing. We can continually improve ourselves. We can continually improve humankind by understanding better when certain types of stimuli should be applied to brain. And doing it in a way that's informed by really rigorous science as opposed to uh, mom and pop recipes that work for Mrs. Jones in Kansas once. That's true, but I wouldn't actually underestimate the value of teachers. You know, it's interesting that, that grammar school teachers, whether they be nursery school all the way up through, through 12th grade, they're remarkably perceptive in terms of trying to tailor a curriculum a feature to a student or a class because they've learned that's when the kids are really receptive to learning a new language or new mathematical concept. And so they've really done this in an empirical way to try to match when certain stimuli should be presented. But adding fundamental neuroscience and quantitative neuroscience to the mix I think would be beneficial. Can you imagine a day in which we know so much more about the brain and we know how circuits are informed by the genome and vice versa that we have something we could call personalized education, a curriculum that is really specifically designed for the brain of the person who's going to partake of it. Absolutely. It's not only a normal behavior, normal development, normal education, but, you know, God forbid if there's an accident or a disease befalls you as an individual, you want to make sure that whatever the prescription is, whether it's a therapeutic intervention or physical therapy or what have you, that that is tailored specifically to your injury and your capacity to improve based upon your genome, based upon your brain configuration. And so the point that I think you're, you're driving at is that all of these data, whether it be from the genetic level to the systems neuroscience level, need to be considered. And this informatics problem literally transcends from the molecule to the mind. And that presents, you know, grander challenges than we've already described. We thank you for your time. It's an exciting future. You're a big part of it. Art, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us on our mind.